good afternoon. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Calgary Co-op for hosting us here today, one of the, their very big stores in Calgary, and specifically uh, Calgary Co-op board chair Patricia McLeod and CEO uh, Ken Keeler, who just welcomed us for letting us uh, use the space in the Crowfoot, uh, Crowfoot Co-op Pharmacy here. Uh, one of the many pharmacies that is participating in our critical COVID-19 vaccine program. I'm joined here by Health Minister Tyler Shandro, Finance Minister Travis Tays, and AHS President Bernie Yu to talk about but what Budget 2021 means for health care in Alberta. Specifically, the historic investment that Alberta's government is making in the health and well-being of Albertans. Uh, and that does... Uh, if Budget 21 is passed by the legislature, the budget that Minister Tays introduced last week, the overall health care budget will receive an increase of $900 million, nearly a billion dollars, and that doesn't include the $1.25 billion that in extra funding that we've set aside as a COVID contingency fund for addressing the pandemic health care costs. Uh, Minister Shandra will get into the details of that in a moment, but uh, between, the, uh, between those two uh, increases in funding, the $900 million uh, for health care generally and the $1.25 billion uh, for COVID-related care, we're talking about an increase of, of uh, $2,115,000,000. Uh, that's about 10% of the overall health care budget. Albertans have told us that their number one priority is fighting COVID-19, and Albertans government has responded with the single largest ever healthcare investment for one year in Alberta history. That's on top of the $2 billion in emergency pandemic spending last year. When it comes to fighting this virus and protecting lives, Alberta's government has stepped up just as Albertans have in so many ways. We provided extra funding for hospitals and long-term care, and provided free rooms and hotels so people can isolate uh, uh, when they need to. Early in the pandemic, uh, Alberta's government made a $53 million investment in mental health and addiction support uh, to help make sure that people in this crisis would get the help they need uh, during times of social isolation and financial stress. And we were the first province to step up in, in a major way to address the mental health aspect of the pandemic. And that's, of course, on top of the $50 million of immediate funding that we provided uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic uh, to critical community groups like homeless shelters, women shelters, um, food banks, and others. And by the way, uh, let me just say here at Co-op, they've just announced uh, $2.2 billion, million, excuse me, million dollars of financial support from their company and their customers for groups like that. When the second, uh, when we saw the, the fall spike of COVID in the fall, we took action to protect the healthcare system with aggressive public health measures to bend the curve and slow the spread of the virus with renewed relief programs for businesses most impacted. Since day one, we've said that we'll spend whatever is necessary to ensure that the health system has the resources that it needs to protect, uh, uh, to, to care for and to protect Albertans, especially the vulnerable. <clears throat> Budget 21 follows through on that commitment. It strikes a thoughtful balance between investing in healthcare to protect lives through, throughout the pandemic while uh, investing in uh, protecting livelihoods, uh, preparing us for the recovery that will accelerate once mass immunization is complete. And I want to remind people the only thing standing up between us and that mass immunization and greater freedom and getting back to normal is the federal government getting us uh, doses so that we can inoculate Albertans with. That is the critical central issue right now. And we're not going to let them get away with a lack of accountability for Canada being the 44th in the world now on per capita inoculations. It's not acceptable for a country of Canada's stature uh, and size and sophistication. But here we are, and, and we, we cannot wait to get uh, uh, as soon as possible, large supplies of doses so that pharmacies like the co-op one behind me can start um, delivering those vaccines to save lives and, and get us back to normal. We're keeping our promise to prioritize health care funding and ensure Albertans continue to have access to quality and sustainable health care. A year into this pandemic, and it's just, I, I, I think, my 
big uh, revelation about how bad this was going to be was a year ago this week. A year into this, I don't need to tell hardworking Albertans that the effects of COVID-19 are far-reaching and long-lasting. We all feel it every day. Though some days it may feel like this pandemic may never end, things will get better. As I said, widespread immunization will help us get back to a more normal existence uh, this year. And that's why we're continuing to plan ahead, create jobs, and prepare for recovery by investing $3.5 billion over the next three years in key health ca capital projects uh, right across the province. When I say capital projects, that means expanding um, hospitals, modernizing healthcare uh, infrastructure, uh, and uh, and so much more. Completing the children's hospital, uh, the cancer excuse me, the cancer hospital here in Calgary, and so on. And with last week's news of a tentative agreement between the Alberta government and the Alberta Medical Association, uh, I'm hopeful that we can move forward in a renewed partnership to help Albertans get through COVID. Uh, as soon as possible. We know there's a, a lot more work to do and the next year will be key in determining how we emerge. Budget 2021 is a clear acknowledgement that Alberta's government will continue to do what's needed to protect lives and livelihoods. That's been our goal since day one. Now I'll invite uh, Minister Shandro uh, to fill you in on some of the details. Thank you very much, Premier, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, uh, th well, thank you to COA, for, as, as Premier said. Thank you to the board chair, Patty McLeod, as well as the CEO, uh, Ken Keeler. And uh, thank you to all the staff as well who've joined us here today to, to watch. Thanks for letting us uh, have our announcement here today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleased to uh, provide additional details about the important funding our government has dedicated to our ongoing response to, uh, to COVID. And as Alberta's healthcare system continues to be a leader in its response to the pandemic, it will remain under pressure until widespread vaccination has been completed, as Premier said. And that means that we'll continue to adapt, we'll continue to adjust over the coming months. But I want to assure Albertans that the healthcare system will be there whenever Albertans need it. And we made a promise that the response to COVID would not be constrained by the budget that any resources that the system needed or that AHS needed would be there and would be there for patients, there for Albertans. And we're keeping that promise. As Premier mentioned, Budget 21 includes $1.25 billion in new one-time funding to continue to protect Albertans through the pandemic. And this funding, which is on top of the $2 billion provided last year for, for health, will help to ensure that Alberta remains a leader in the pandemic response, including rolling out vaccinations, and nothing is more important than that this year. Alberta's vaccination program will continue in a phased approach. All seniors who are 75 and older are eligible to be vaccinated, and in fact, well over half of them are booked. I think I was just told by Dr. Yu that 125,000 bookings, 35,000 already vaccinated, as well as 22,000 will be vaccinated in March for who are living in congregate care. And uh, right now we're doing around 50,000 doses a week in line with the, uh, the current schedule of deliveries through March. We're also putting plans in place to ramp up to match any potential increase in supply. We will be ready to deliver as many as 250,000 doses a week by the end of March. And that's a million doses a month. It's a big number, but remember, we do roughly that many every year at the start of our flu campaign. So like I've said from the start, we can roll out any supply that we get. That's due to the amazing efforts of AHS staff and also thanks to our community partners like the pharmacies, such as co-op uh, pharmacies, who will play an important role to help getting Albertans vaccinated in the days ahead. And will benefit from the involvement of family physicians as well. $1.25 billion in COVID contingency, this is critical in ensuring that AHS and all of our frontline workers have every tool at their disposal throughout the response to the pandemic. It's also vital in easing the pressure on our health system so that Albertans can get the expert care that they need when and where they need it. 
And as Premier mentioned, the effects of the pandemic are significant. The effects are widespread, especially in our health system. For our health care workers, it's meant that there are many long days, time away from family, and increased risk, risk of exposure to the virus. And unfortunately, for many Albertans, it's meant a disruption in their own health care. Now, whether that's due to the postponement of a scheduled surgery, or the delay of a diagnostic service, or even the hesitation to see a family physician about a new or worsening condition, these disruptions are negatively affecting too many folks. Budget 21 ensures that our health system will have the resources that it needs to continue to provide quality public health care while keeping Albertans safe, keeping Albertans healthy throughout the pandemic. And on top of this, uh, on top of the, the vaccine rollout, one-time funding will also be used for testing and contract tracing, uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, to address the surgical backlog that's been caused by the pandemic and to protect the lives of Albertans. I hope this news provides relief to those who have been patiently waiting for important procedures. Alberta's government is con uh, committed to ensuring that these procedures can be completed more quickly so that you can experience and improve quality of life. We're also protecting our most vulnerable citizens in the province, those who live in continuing care settings during the pandemic and as well after the pandemic. The continuing care system has been hit hard by the pandemic and the $1.25 billion in COVID contingency will also support the continuing care system and their continued response to the pandemic, providing for costs that are associated with increased staffing, including comfort aids, as well as additional equipment that's required for our, our uh, continuing care operators, cleaning supplies, and protective uh, equipment as well. Now, aside from COVID-related funding, we're also ensuring the healthcare services that Albertans need resulting from the uh, impacts of COVID are funded as well. We're ensuring that our doctors are here to care for you for both your COVID as well as your non-COVID related healthcare needs. And we're maintaining the physician compensation and development budget at $5.4 billion in 21-22. And we look forward to having a stronger relationship with physicians in the days ahead as they have a critical role in shaping our health system overall. The last year has been difficult for Albertans. Alberta's government wants to ensure that uh, supports for emotional and mental well-being are available throughout the pandemic, as well as for years to come. And that is why government is continuing with our commitment to invest $140 million over four years for mental health and addiction supports, including $40 million for the budget year 21-22. And this, uh, this funding will be used to increase access to services, expand programs, and establish new publicly funded mental health and addiction treatment spaces. This is uh, in, addition, uh, in addition to the more than $800 million that AHS spends each year on the, the various addiction and mental health services in communities across the province. Further, Government is investing $34 million in 2122 for the Children's Health Supports Program. This is a new program that we are funding in Budget 21 to expand mental health and rehabilitation services for children and for youth. In a time of great concern and uncertainty, Albertans can take comfort to be sure of at least two things. Everyone wants a COVID vaccine, will receive one this year. And we'll continue to support and invest in the health and the well-being of Albertans during as well as after the pandemic. With this historic investment in health, our government's commitment to prioritizing health care funding and ensuring that folks have access to quality health care with a sustainable system is clear. And life has dramatically changed. But Albertans, uh, Alberta's government is with you every step of the way. And as this pandemic continues and we move forward on vaccinations, please know that we will continue to do everything we can to protect your lives and to protect your livelihoods. I thank you and I'll now invite Minister Taves to, uh, to come and uh, say a few words.
Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I would like to, as well, express my thanks to uh, co-op management and staff here for generously hosting us today. It's, uh, it's so great to see a thriving Alberta business. So many businesses have been so innovative and creative during this time of challenge, and, uh, and Alberta Co-op is a great example of that. Uh, today we also heard, uh, the Premier mentioned it, um, just about the great compassion and benevolence that uh, Co-op uh, employees, uh, customers, suppliers, and management have made over this last year. And that's just a, that's a great Alberta story because it's happening from one corner of the province to the other. And uh, so I just, I just say thank you uh, to all the folks here and to Albertans generally for stepping up uh, with neighbor helping neighbor and, uh, and friend helping friend. It's really a pleasure uh, to join uh, Premier uh, Kenny, uh, Minister Shandro and Dr. Verna Yu today uh, in this funding announcement. As you know, I tabled the budget 2021 a few days ago in the legislature uh, the budget is about protecting lives and livelihoods during one of the most difficult times in our history as a province. And to that end, one of the foremost themes of the budget is ensuring our health care system has the resources required to deal adequately with the pandemic. In uh, 2020, $5.8 billion in expense and $700 million in capital investment is uh, forecast to address the COVID-19 pandemic response and the economic recovery. A further $3.1 billion is budgeted in 2021 for economic recovery. And as both Premier and Minister Shandro have highlighted, the budget also includes an additional $1.25 billion to directly fight the pandemic. The funding in this envelope will be available as needed to ensure the health system is adequately resourced. As we've seen over the past year, the pandemic and its impacts are volatile and ever-changing and exact needs and costs are often difficult to predict. With this $1.25 billion contingency, Alberta's government has taken a prudent approach that allows us to continue to fight the pandemic and address emerging priorities that may arise during these uncertain times. In addition to this and other commitments outlined by Minister Shandro, Budget 2021 also includes a three-year $3.4 billion commitment for health-related capital projects and programs. This includes $2.2 billion for health facilities with $143 million for five new priority projects. Government will spend $1.5 billion over three years on strategic investments in key economic sectors. This funding will provide new training skills, development opportunities, and further new sector strategies in areas like technology, pharmaceutical and health sciences, aviation, energy, financial services, and of course agriculture. The government has also set aside an additional $500 million for further economic recovery initiatives that may be required throughout the year. While Alberta's government is investing in health care and preparing for recovery, it's also important to safeguard Alberta's fiscal future. Fiscal anchors will continue to inform our financial decisions, ensuring we're positioned for fiscal recovery. First, the government is living up to its commitment to keep Alberta's net debt below 30% of its gross domestic product, or GDP. Second, the government is committed and determined to deliver services most cost-effectively, given that the McKinnon panel pointed out that Alberta has historically spent more than other provinces. And third, the government remains committed to balancing the budget. We will set a clear time frame for getting back to balance once the pandemic is over and we have additional economic clarity. The government of Alberta is laser focused on continuing to fight the pandemic, positioning the province for economic recovery and growth and delivering government services most efficiently. We're entering the second year of COVID-19 and our province continues to face down the pandemic and the economic downturn. Budget 2021 was developed in response to these challenges. It's a plan that will see Alberta past its current crisis by focusing on what matters most, health and jobs. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Yu uh, to make a few comments.
Thank you and good morning. I'm really pleased to be here alongside our Premier, Health Minister and Finance Minister to talk about the latest budget and what it means for healthcare over the next year. Friday is going to be the one year anniversary of the first case of COVID-19 uh, being officially announced in Alberta. I don't know that any of us would have entirely predicted what that year had in store for us, nor that a year later that we would still be in the thick of it. The government of Alberta has been our partner and supporter through all, all of this, ensuring that our health care system had the additional support it needed to cope and meet the needs of Albertans. As we move forward, we all look forward to the day that COVID-19 will be consuming our professional and personal lives. Until that time, Budget 2021 gives the healthcare system the resources that we need to finish this fight, as well as help us gain ground once we're able to focus completely on recovery. Our physicians and staff have worked tirelessly over the last year to ensure that the appropriate care is available to Albertans when they need it. I'm grateful to all the teams who have worked to find solutions and have adapted to each new challenge introduced by the pandemic. This budget will ensure that our frontline staff continue to be protected as they care for our sick and most vulnerable Albertans. The pandemic has increased the need for mental health and additional services, and I'm heartened to see that the strategic additional investments in creating access for these services for Albertans. HS is in the midst of rolling out probably one of the most ambitious vaccination programs that our province has ever seen. We are learning and improving as we go. We are honored to be playing such a critical role in delivering hope to Albertans as they become eligible and sign up for vaccination appointments. You truly appreciate the sacrifices of Albertans have made when you see the joy and relief on the faces of the people who have received their vaccine. It's been an extremely long road for all of us. The journey is not yet over, but with the support of the government of Alberta, we will finish this fight. I'm confident that Alberta Health Services will be well resourced as we continue to fight COVID-19 with the funding that has been made available through Budget 21, as well as being positioned to meet the health needs of Albertans. So thank you very much, Premier, uh, to our Health Minister and to our Finance Minister for ensuring that we continue delivering high quality patient and safe care. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yu. Now we'll go to the phone lines. Just to get to as many questions as possible, we just ask that you limit yourself to one question. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? First is Bill Fortier with CTV News. Go ahead, Bill. Hi, good morning. I, have that. I do have two questions, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, for the Health Minister and potentially for the Premier, if he, if he wishes to weigh in. Uh, first of all, there's confusion from gym uh, members and owners about what's high intensity and what's low intensity. Um, you know, you can't run, but you can walk. Or can you jog? Can you power walk? Who makes the calls and what happens if a, a gym employee and a member disagree on that? I'm looking for some clarification there. The second one is you're standing in a store by a pharmacy that appears to be open. The public health order you brought in says we all have to wear masks in a business like that. Why are you all taking yours off to speak? Thanks. Uh, well, uh, we're, we're taking with a mask when we're at the podium uh, within the, uh, the requirements of what's, uh, or what's allowed at, in a workplace a setting when you're allowed to sit down at your desk. We're interpreting that with the podium so that people can understand us when we're speaking at the microphone. Uh, but to all of us, if you were able to see everybody else around us right now does have masks on, so obviously all of us are complying with that, that requirement of the, uh, the public health restrictions for masks. Um, good question about the, uh, the gyms. Your first question, Bill. And um, look, the, the feedback that we had from uh, the gym owners and those in the fitness sector was for us to make it more simple uh, uh, for, for what is, is allowed and what isn't allowed and to try and, and make us more aligned with what's happening in BC. So we heard that feedback and that's why there is the distinction between high and low. You asked a really good question. Who decides that? Well, it is going to be the gym owners who are going to be able to work with their patrons and be able to interpret that. Uh, the definition for intensity, high intensity, low intensity, same as BC's, um, I think it says whether there is a, a significant increase in your respiration. Uh, here's how I interpret it. If you're, you're out of breath, it's high intensity. If you're not out of breath, it's, uh, it's low intensity. So there's an opportunity for our gyms in step two for them to be able to continue to move forward with more activities 
in their, their, um, their businesses for more patrons to be able to do more things. And uh, look, uh, still no high intensity fitness like spin classes, but lots of um, uh, group, uh, low intensity um, activities that can be done, a lot of uh, low intensity um, cardio can be done on machine, a lot of low intensity weightlifting as well. We're asking people to keep themselves safe, keep everybody else around them safe, keep the patrons safe. Everybody wants that, the gym owners want that as well. They were looking for more to be done, more to be allowed in their facilities, and that's exactly what we did, hearing that feedback from them. Uh, Peter, anything else? Yeah, they, they just in addition to uh, what Tyler said, um, so over the past several months, the fitness industry, gyms and others have made a lot of submissions to Dr. Hinshaw and her team about how they could safely operate. Uh, and I know that uh, she took a very close look at that, as well as the experience over in BC, which has had pretty much these rules in place uh, since last summer. And uh, they seem to have done well by that. Uh, BC has had uh, generally lower levels of uh, daily cases and hospitalizations than Alberta. Uh, while maintaining this kind of limited opening for fitness uh, businesses like gyms. Uh, one thing that we do know from a year of data around the world and uh, hundreds of research papers is that uh, physical exertion uh, close to others can be uh, a cause, a high risk cause of transmission. And so uh, we all know that the, through the science, that the way this virus is transmitted is through droplets that can be projected if people uh, are uh, respiring heavily, if they are uh, exerting themselves physically. And so uh, that kind of activity would be high risk. That's why um, uh, that, that's not permitted anywhere in Canada. Uh, but this is a, an important step forward that allows uh, gyms and fitness businesses substantially to reopen and offer uh, many of their services. It is going to have uh, impose some responsibility on gym owners to carefully monitor their businesses and make sure that folks are, are staying COVID safe. Uh, but that's what they asked for, was, was this responsibility and these parameters. Uh, and uh, we, we hope that, that it, it, it demonstrates their, their ability to, to, to begin much reopening, to do business. We understand as well the case that uh, gym and fitness business owners have made about the link between physical and, and mental and emotional health. Uh, and so this hopefully will also uh, help uh, many of their clients and, and customers. Operator, can you please put for our next caller? Next is James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. Hi, there. This is a question for the health minister, although if the premier wants to weigh in. I, I want to get your thoughts on DC's plans to stretch the time before second vaccine goes to 16 weeks in order to give the first shot to everyone uh, who wants it by July. What do you think of this? Uh, is Alberta considering something similar, uh, or is the province considering extending the second dose further by any measure, if not four months, uh, some other time? And, and sorry, James, uh, do you mind, cause maybe just because of the angle uh, where I, I was standing when I, you first started the question, do you mind repeating that? Oh, sure, yeah. I'm hoping to get your thoughts on uh, BC's plan to stretch the time uh, before the second vaccine dose to 16 weeks as part of a plan to give everyone their first shot by July. So I'm wondering what, what you think about this, and is Alberta considering uh, anything similar? Yeah, we are considering. Uh, we have received uh, that advice uh, from physicians and our uh, provincial um, vaccine advisory uh, committee that's made up of, of uh, physicians and uh, public health folks. Um, so we are considering that. We have looked at the, there's uh, fantastic evidence that's coming out of the United Kingdom as well as Quebec and BC uh, for us uh, to feel certain that the, the length of time between first and second dose for the, uh, the messenger RNA vaccines uh, to, uh, to be extended. And so that, that is something we are going to, to consider. Now, what the exact uh, period of time is going to be uh, is still to be decided. We'll be announcing it soon, but we will. Uh, be looking at uh, having that length of time between first and second extended. It's also going to help make sure that as we have um, Pfizer vaccines between 50, 50, 55,000 uh, coming per week uh, in the, the month of March and as well as uh, more AstraZeneca um, or AstraZeneca finally coming to, to Alberta 
it's going to give us a, an opportunity to get more people vaccinated more quickly, which is going to be fantastic news for Albertans. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Next is Dean Bennett with the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Dean. Thanks. Uh, Minister Shandro, my question follows up a little bit on James Keller. You remember last, late last year the uh, AHS was holding back some vaccines for second doses and, and uh, you urged them to just give the first doses to everybody that we can. And then, of course, we had a bit of a, a shortage when the, when the feds couldn't deliver. So my question is, this time around, what is your vaccine policy? Are you trying to get as many first doses out and don't hold very many uh, per second? Or do you want to still have a, 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 a secure selection of second doses available? Uh, thanks, Dean. And it is going to depend for each of these, these vaccines themselves as well. Um, so we are still in the middle of now. We did have a policy. We are in the middle of reviewing that with the new evidence from the United Kingdom, as well as from BC and Quebec, and, and looking at the, um, uh, the the protection from a, 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 the first dose of a vaccine and how long that that protection lasts for us to extend that period of time. That's also going to to change. Obviously, the very first priority for us is to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. I think you asked that question in particular. So absolutely, that's, that's the first priority for us. Um, and uh, we have had to, to make some considerations, not knowing the predictability and the stability of the delivery of vaccines, seeing the rug pulled out from under us in February, uh, made us um, have to, to change that policy for February at least. But um, as we do make this announcement and, and a change in the length of time between first and second dose um, is going to give us an opportunity to review that policy, uh, which we're, we'll be making uh, uh, we'll be making an announcement on, on that policy as well at the same time. Thank you, Dean. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Next is Julia Wong with Global News. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, this question is also for the Health Minister, but if the Premier wants to chime in, that'd be great. What is the status of Phase 2 Group B, which is those with underlying health conditions? What types of conditions are experts looking at, and when can Albertans expect a decision on which conditions have been identified? Uh, thank you. So the, uh, the public health folks are still in the process of reviewing what uh, the recommendations should be. Obviously, the focus is going to be on the most vulnerable, so it's, uh, there's going to be a primary focus on... The, the types of conditions that can lead to a comorbidity um, and uh, so obviously people who have hypertension and those types of concerns that could make them vulnerable to a severe outcome like hospitalization or death is going to be the number one consideration for us. Um, we've received a lot of feedback as well and a lot of uh, correspondence. Um, a lot of folks who have sometimes a rare disease um, for us to, to make sure that that is considered so sometimes the, the parameters of, of what's included in, in 2B um, may, may try to be more general, but we will also try to have considerations for people who have something very specific that may not be included or there may be uh, some lack of clarity in the, the general principles of the, what's included in 2B. And we'll have to work with those folks and, uh, and make sure that Dr. Hinshaw's office is uh, understanding um, all of their advocacy as well. So we'll, we'll hopefully have those um, the, the announcement um, and, and that information provided to, to those patients as quickly as possible. Okay. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Next is Scott Diffel, CBC. Go ahead, Scott. Yes, yeah, so I have a question for either the health minister or to the head of HS. Uh, given that there are currently no vaccination clinics uh, and not even any drug stores in the far northeast end of Calgary. Just wondering if you can shed any light on the plan to get COVID-19 vaccines closer to the thousands of people who live in that part of Calgary. Well, Dr. Yu, do you mind, mind answering that? To what's uh, available to, to folks who are in the northeast? And um, um, obviously, we do want to expand, um, before I do pass it on to Dr. Yu, for our, our community pharmacies and family physicians, we've had an expression of interest go out uh, for family physicians, and um, so we're, we're continuing to work with the Alberta Medical Association and those family physicians to onboard the, the physicians who uh, are interested in, in being able to have the capacity for them to be able to um, help us with the administration of vaccines in the community, as well as 
the 102 pharmacies that we started off with um, partnering with and getting uh, the highest volumes out right out right away. We are going to continue to expand from that 102 to having more and more pharmacies, both those who are uh, independent and those who are uh, pharmacies within a large chain, so that they, they can all have an opportunity to help us get as many vaccines out the door as we can, understanding that uh, you know, we want to, to be able to give out as many vaccines as quickly as we give out the, the flu vaccine, which is a million doses in a month. So, but Dr. Yu, for the uh, opportunities in HS. Um, I just want to say that when we rolled out the vaccine distribution uh, for the 75 plus community seniors, we had about 80 uh, plus sites throughout the province, uh, making sure that we were able to have a certain distance, um, uh, you know, travelable distance so that it wouldn't be too stressful for many of the Albertans. Uh, to be honest, I can't be very uh, sure about the specific question about Northeast Calgary. We can always get you back that information about what we're doing to try to bridge some of the uh, gaps. Uh, the other thing I just want to highlight is, is that we actually have been also working, obviously, with the Ministry of Health to look at the also the distribution from all the pharmacies, all uh, several hundred of them, and to make sure that we also don't have gaps uh, between the pharmacies and ourselves. And then when the physicians are brought on board, that will add another uh, component to that actually will ensure that I would say most parts of the provinces will be very well served. Operator, can you please put through? Thank you. Or sorry, I'll just note that we have time for two more questions. Um, operator, can you please put through our next caller? This is Rick Fell with the Calgary Sun. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, good morning. Uh, a question for the Premier. It's kind of a post-COVID question. Um, and, it's on, and it's on the budget. And I know the Minister, Finance Minister is there, and he's already sort of answered it, but it's still not clear to me. So perhaps you could uh, help. Um, I understand the government's position is right now, in the middle of the pandemic, is not the time to reach into taxpayer wallets and take more money. That is to say, the question of more taxes is just off the table during the pandemic. I understand that. So right now, that's not going to happen. But I think a lot of people are interested in what happens afterwards. Why is it the case that your government does not just say no we are not going to have a sales tax. We are not going to put a sales tax on a referendum. We are just not going to have anything to do with the sales tax from our end or any other major tax like a health care premium or such things. Why is that just not ruled out? Not not now. It's ruled out for now. But why is it all why is it not ruled out for twenty twenty two or twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four or whenever? Why why can you not take that position? And that's for the Premier. Sure. And Minister Cave, if you want to sure. Thanks for the good question, Rick. First of all, uh, we've been clear that now would be the worst time to uh, dig government's hand deeper into the pockets of Albertans at a time of great financial and economic uh, adversity and uncertainty. Uh, we've also been clear that uh, this government will always defend and respect the Taxpayer Protection Act which uh, I successfully lobbied Ralph Klein's government to bring in back in 1995. It says that Albertans, uh, not the government, but Albertans through a direct referendum vote uh, have the final say on any potential future sales tax. So Albertans are the boss when it comes to that. Uh, when you ask uh, about broader future tax policy, we did say in our platform that we were elected on that we would have a, uh, an expert panel take a look at Alberta's tax mix uh, to see if it's the best uh, tax policy for job creation and for ec to support economic growth. We will keep that commitment with a review of Alberta's tax policy. As you know, the previous government made us uh, took away a lot of our Alberta advantage when they raised the top marginal income tax rate by 50%. They raised taxes on job creating businesses by 20% and hammered consumers. Rick, I would remind you that this government as its very first act uh, delivered the largest tax relief in Alberta's history uh, by eliminating uh, the $2 billion carbon tax. So we've already delivered, so, and we've also uh, rolled back 
the job killing hike in taxes on on businesses. So we've this is a government you're talking about tax increases. This is a government that has substantially lowered the tax burden on Albertans. And we want taxes to be as low as they can, not just now, but five years from now and ten years from now, now and in the future. Uh, this is the former uh, head of the Taxpayers Federation here. And so uh, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our core principles is uh, more money for taxpayers and, and, and government operating more efficiently. Uh, and that's really the, the next big challenge in front of us, which is coping, obviously coping with COVID and the pandemic, the recession, and but while at the same time uh, operating more efficiently. And, and here's the bottom line. When we get to, uh, based on Travis's budget of last week, we get to 2023, around the time of, of uh, the next provincial election, uh, we, we currently expect to be at a de have a deficit in the range of, of $8 billion. And by that point, by that point, to have uh, found savings through some really tough decisions uh, that will bring us to the average spending amongst major Canadian provinces. Then Albertans are going to have to have a debate, okay? We brought our spending down. We've made some difficult decisions, some cuts, a lot of cuts. We've, we've saved seven or eight billion dollars from where it otherwise would have been. But we still have, if we still have at that point an eight billion dollar gap, then Albertans are going to have to tell their next government, give their, ne their next government their marching orders. Do you want more spending cuts? Or do you want to keep running deficits forever? Or do we want to find a way to, to address that through, uh, through revenue as well, or some mix of the above? That's a debate that Albertans will have to have in another day. But one thing is for sure, uh, if Albertans want to have a sales tax, they'll be the ones that decide, uh, not, not uh, the government. Travis? You want to answer that? I think you covered it well. I'll, I'll just make one point. Really. Okay. Well, Rick, I, I appreciate that question. Uh, what we're doing right now, we're, we're managing the bottom half of the income statement. We're managing what we can manage, and that's ensuring health is adequately resourced. That's about positioning the province for economic recovery and growth. And that's about delivering uh, government services most efficiently. And when we get to 23, 24, when we've reached a very defensible, uh, efficient uh, delivery of government services metric, uh, at that point in time, we will have done the heavy lifting to position this province uh, for fiscal sustainability. And again, as the Premier noted, there's a sequencing here. We're focusing on what we need to focus on today. Operator, can you please put through our final call? Final call, excuse me, final caller is Charlotte Dumoulin with Radio Canada, Edmonton. Go ahead. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Desmond Kenny. J'ai une question pour vous concernant vos critiques face au gouvernement fédéral. Vous dites que c'est le seul obstacle à la campagne de vaccination en Alberta. À quoi vous vous attendez exactement? Qu'est-ce que le gouvernement fédéral pourrait faire? Euh, de mieux. Et ici, une question sur le vaccin à AstraZeneca. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous allez faire avec ce vaccin? À quelle population il va être euh, destiné? OK, merci. For, uh, just to translate uh, for those uh, in English here, it's a question about federal vaccine delivery and procurement. And, uh, alors, uh, évidemment, uh, le, la per performance du gouvernement fédéral quant uh, au vaccin est un uh, échec total. Le Canada est Uh, pire que le quatrième au monde per capita dans uh, l'accès au vaccin de COVID-19. Uh, uh, Excusez-moi, ce n'est pas quatrième. Nous sommes le quarantième. Uh, Nous sommes le quarantième au monde quant au uh, uh, accès au vaccin de COVID-19. Ça, c'est inacceptable aux Canadiens. Et uh, nous voyons que l'Israël a presque 90% de leur population qui ont été vaccinés. Le Royaume-Uni, plus de euh, presque 20% de leur population. Les États-Unis, plus de 10% de leur population. Le Canada, 4% de notre population. Ce n'est pas acceptable. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle nous, euh, nous appelons au gouvernement fédéral d'accélérer l'accès aux vaccins pour les Canadiens, ici, y compris celles ici en Alberta. On est prêt, on est prêt d'administrer centaines de milliers de doses 
euh, par semaine avec les pharmacies, avec les médecins euh, euh, et directement euh, du système de santé. Mais on n'a pas besoin des doses. On, mais on n'a pas les doses. On n'a pas les doses. Et euh, alors, c'est clair à moi que le fédéral a été trop tôt en, pour, pour confirmer les contrats pour obtenir les vaccins des grands producteurs, des grandes sociétés pharmaceutiques. Et euh, deuxièmement, c'est clair qu'il y a une, une sorte de nationalisme dans l'industrie pharmaceutique, pharmaceutique en Europe et aux États-Unis. Mais le Canada aura, euh, aura prévenu cette situation là l'année dernière avec l'accélération des efforts de manufacturiers les, euh, les vaccins ici au Canada. Mais ils ont euh, ils, ils, ils ont euh, c'était un échec à cet égard. C'est les raisons pour lesquelles l'Alberta, avec l'Ontario, co-préside un comité euh, des provinces pour euh, trouver les opportunités de produire les vaccins ici domestiquement au Canada. Mais en bout de ligne, on est prêt à administrer centaines de milliers par semaine. Nous poursuivons les possibilités de produire les vaccins ici au Canada avec, en partenaire, euh, partenariat avec les autres provinces. Mais en bout de ligne, on est limité par l'incapacité du fédéral d'obtenir assez des doses des vaccins. Merci. Thank you.